everyone and welcome to another session of Coffee with Developers. Today we have a very special guest. He has been a tech journalist for many, many years. He has written for The Wired, Mashable, The Economist, BBC, TechCrunch and many other tech media. He has uh, spoken at uh, more than 200 conferences and events globally. And he had the opportunity to interview people such as Steve Wozniak, Roger Ver, John McAfee, and even Kim Kardashian. He has spent a lot of time in the mobile media gaming industry. And recently he joined the Siena Network as chief evangelist. So it's a very big pleasure for me to welcome Monty Manford. Hello, Monty. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm not too bad, say, say Ed. Um, you know, it's been a while, isn't it? We saw each other, what, three months ago in Vienna? Yes, it was three months ago when you interviewed Sir Tim Berners-Lee. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it was definitely for him a pleasure being interviewed by you. No, that was, I think that was a bit longer. I think that was about six months ago. But me and you met in person in Vienna. Oh, true. Yeah. So the Congress was uh, six months ago. True. Um, but we met in Vienna three months ago. Yes, exactly. Thank it was fun. Thanks for the chocolates. Um, I gave them to my wife and his girl, uh, my wife, my son and his girlfriend. Um, and maybe you should tell your audience how I saved your life again. Oh, man. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, you saved my life actually twice because uh, for the people who don't know, Monty has interviewed Steve Wozniak on stage uh, in 2018. Um, there were, I think, 5,000 people um, in, the, in the room and we needed a really good moderator to handle the situation because it was basically, you, you don't have Steve Wozniak at every event, you know. And so we contacted Monty Manford. I, I don't even remember how we how we yeah, yeah. Get con got connected, but actually you did a really really good job, and I think that you have been the real star of oh, well, uh, this session. Well, I think that's very true. I think you I think you're you're stretching the truth, but that's very kind of you to say so. Okay, but that's fine. But it was not your first time when you have interviewed uh, interviewed Steve Wozniak, right? So you have done that uh, once before. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, remember, I said I saved your life the second time when you lost your phone in Vienna. Oh, yeah, no, but that that's then the third time, right? Because the second time was we again needed a super moderator to interview Sir Tim Berners Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, this year in June at our Virtual World Congress, and Monty was uh, yeah, I was happy that Monty. Uh, joined us again, did a great panel discussion with Sir Tim. And uh, yeah, the third time was uh, we met in Vienna. True, I lost my phone. I uh, left it in the cab. That's and true. yeah, you kind of called me and the phone rang and then the taxi driver came and, and gave me my phone back, yes. I'm your guardian angel, man. I'm your guardian yeah, man. angel. Always got your six, man. Always got your back. No, it wasn't the first time I uh, was. Um, the first time was quite weird. Um, uh, a great friend of mine was putting on a conference in Beirut in Lebanon. I'm a huge fan of uh, Lebanon. And what's happening there at the moment is, a, is an utter tragedy. You know, I'm, I'm, you've seen the clips of the explosion maybe one year ago. Yeah. Like a yeah. Nuclear war, you know. Um, but it was happier days in 2016. So um, I was invited to go to the show, you know what I mean? I was charging a fee, which was great. It was, it was quite a, a nice fee. Um, and I was just there to do some MC duties, some moderation duties, you know, be on a panel or something like that. And then about two days before the show, um, I got a call from the organiser. And I, I remember saying to my wife at the time, this is either really, really, really good news or really, really bad news. You know what I mean? And it was really, really good news. Uh, and they wanted me to interview Steve Wozniak. And up until that point, I'd, I'd spoken at a lot of shows and, you know, like basically a band doing the small pubs, the small bars, not the big stadium. I'd never done a big stadium before. Um, so I was pretty nervous, but they gave me some confidence and everything like that. And uh, we went there. <clears throat> I was MC with, uh, well, a joint MC with... Um, the Slovakian president's daughter. And actual fact, before I went to see you in Vienna three months ago, I went to her wedding in Bratislava 
So it was only a short drive to come over to be, to, to Vienna. So we became very good friends on stage. Oh, I remember you were driving with your car from London through whole yeah, of yeah. Europe, Bratislava, Vienna, Croatia, and so on. So I hope you survived it. Uh, I got involved in a hit and run. I had some problems with the police, but I managed to go to 13 countries in 12, 12 countries in 13 days in a VW Golf 2008. So okay. that, is, that was good. Place. And what, what was your favorite place? Uh, well, obviously, yeah. You know. Ah, okay, that's that's yeah. good to hear. But let's, let's get back know. to Steve Wozniak. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, so anyway, um, so what I'm trying to say is I was the co MC. Uh, Natalia was my co-host -co and she was she she destroyed my confidence because we had we were interviewing Brett King, he's a fintech guy, he's a he's a great friend of mine now. Uh, and she said, Hello, baby, and there were ten thousand people there. I mean, it was amazing, you know what I mean? People were cheering, everything. Uh, and so Natalia said to the audience, well, it would be nice if you could smile, Monty, because I was so scared like this, <laughs> you know what I mean? But that was quite a good comment. So anyway, I interviewed Brett King. Um, and now, the, you know, I was sitting backstage with Wozniak. And there's a couple of good pictures where, you know, he's just sitting backstage. I look, I'm in the background looking like this, as if I'm going to kill him, you know, like some villain. Um, but we had a very good chat backstage. It was all very cool. Uh, ask me anything. You know what I mean? So before we went on stage, the organizer said to me, he said, um, it's, it's, you've got 30 minutes. 30 minutes only because he's going on CNN and you have to completely look at the ticker in front of you and you have to finish there and then. Right? So make sure he doesn't speak too much. Try and stop him. You know, he can speak for America. He, he never stops talking. You, you know what I mean? So I'm like, okay, more pressure. 10,000 people. The people that have been backstage, and I've been backstage with girlfriends who've worked for TV and, 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 and gigs and all that stuff, and I have seen people stare at people in love. I have never seen this done with Steve Wozniak. And mm -hmm. it was also your event in um, We Are Developers in, uh, in Vienna. Where people just go, oh, you know, they can't believe that. that I think it's because they want to see Steve Jobs, really. You know what I mean? It's the closest thing they can get. Anyway, so I go on stage, uh, big long sofa, nervous, you know, want my son to be proud of me. I'm looking at the ticker. I sometimes swear. Well, I do swear quite a lot. I try not to do it on your show. Um, but don't swear, don't swear, don't swear. If there's a... If there's a silence, he will fill the silence. It's an old journalist trick, right? If if if, if there's a silence, let him fill yeah. it. All of this. Good to know. And if he speaks too much, you know, wait for him to take a breath and then jump in. So all of this is going on. I'm looking at the ticker. 25 minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. It's down to eight minutes, 22 seconds or some something like that. And I think, I've just done it. I must have done it. You know what I mean? I actually, I'm actually yeah. going to do this. But what I didn't know, that the organiser, who is a, a great friend of mine, um, had been playing a joke on me. So there was no CNN movie in 30 minutes. It was a one-hour interview. Oh. So it went from 8 minutes and 22 seconds to 38 minutes and 12 seconds. Like, what's gone on? And I froze, Siad. I froze, because I'd, I'd, I'd exhausted all my questions, you know, and I was on the home run. I was done. And then that next half an hour, if it wasn't for him being such a good speaker, a non-stop speaker, I think it wouldn't have worked. But I suddenly, uh, suddenly, well, suddenly, finally got to the end of the interview, went backstage, and then one of my friends went, oh, four of them actually, Started going, ah, you joke, joke, joke. So he joke. saved your life, actually. He saved my life. But when, when, I saw, when they started waving at me, going, ah, I, I started to chase them. I chased <laughs> them backstage. I would have killed them at that moment, I tell you. But it was, but it was all good fun, right? Okay. But um, how it comes, to, how, how did you develop your passion for tech? And how did you become a tech journalist at all? I think I was the opposite. I hated technology. When I was uh, in my early 20s and went traveling, um, I remember writing a poem about dead prairie, prairies full of dead computers. 
because I, because I believed in the human human brains and humanity and chance and randomness, um, and I had no interest. I, I had I didn't use a keyboard until I was about thirty seven, thirty eight years old. I hated really? it. Yeah, I wanted nothing. But you are not that old. No, well, I'm thirty eight tomorrow. <laughs> wow. um, but do you know what I mean? I was I was literally against technology. There was a there was a Peruvian guerrilla group called a thing. Senderos Lumineros, called Light of the Shining Path. Um, and I was obviously a very impressionable young man. And uh, their, their motif was technology is imperialism. And that, that kind of pretty much summed up how I was. You know, I didn't want anything to do with credit cards. I didn't want... That was okay, a long time. What, what, what happened then? Well, what happened was I got older, I suppose. Um, I, I mean, I... I so I, 38. I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I went around the world in '94 and wrote a book with a Mont Blanc pen. This pen here, um, yeah. so I wanted to write a book, not uh, type a book. Um, but then, you know, everything comes to an end, right? I'd been travelling for about 15 years. You know, come back to London, jump, make some money by jumping on a motorbike, mm -hmm. which is technology, obviously. Um, and then thought, well, the book, the book wasn't published. I should learn how to, you know, I should learn how to write properly. So I did a a journalist course for a year and then I was very lucky to get on a course in London at the London College of Printing that only took on 25 people per term mm. and it was postgraduates and I wasn't a graduate so I did quite well in the interview um, so I wanted to write for the Face magazine obviously I wanted to be a football journalist I wanted to be a travel journalist you, yeah. you know but um, one of the things that we had to do was, was to listen to someone at, at, at an event And then write a story up. That was one of the, the one one of the duties. It was basically a two year course condensed into three months, which fitted me because I was older. And one of them said, "Why don't you get into IT publications? You know, this is where the money is. This is where the future is." And I thought about it, and I thought, you know what? I know nothing about this. I think there's something coming around the bend called the internet, which I think is I'm going to have to know about this. Mm, I can't ignore mm. it. I can't say technology is imperialism. It's like technology is, is well, it's whether it's necessary, but what, whatever it was, I thought it was about time. I learned to type, and the hardest and the easiest way to do it was to work for an IT publication, a weekly called Computing. They used to have these huge issues, uh, and I was the sub-editor there uh, for all of these kind of tech journalists who couldn't write. They knew how to, they knew their subjects, but they couldn't write. Uh, and I suppose it started there. I went there for an internment for a turn ship. It felt like an internment. Mm. So um, did you do some ghost writing for them or did you just well, jump just, in and also get some knowledge yeah. about the matter? I, I just kind of w w wiggle, waggled my way in, you know, because I was a bit older than a 21-year-old intern. Everybody presumed I knew more than I did, which was mm. a great, great situation. So they thought when you came into the room, they thought it's the boss coming. Yeah, it's a bit like, you know, when I see you. <laughs> 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 no, seriously. No, but it was just that I was... Some of these people I would never have spoken to when I was traveling. They were just really boring people. And you know what I mean? I, I, by the way, I think developers are amazing. I don't think they're boring. But uh, people in the technology publications are boring. And, you know, they, some of them talk to me with a great deal of respect and some of them talk to me as if I was an idiot. So I just, you know, I just mm. do the odd feature, you know what I mean? I do the odd, you know, the, the letters page or I do this, or do that. Then I just learned my trade. So I was there for about a year um, uh, and also realized that you could go to lots of football matches at the 1998 World Cup. Um, as, a, as a as a tech journalist, and I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. Being a tech journalist in the 2000s might be uh, might be like being a music journalist in the 70s. I could uh, see some mm -hmm. interesting things here. It is actually. Yeah, I, I, I think I think you know until until COVID, I think it probably was. Um, but then you know things went off in a different direction after that. I think I, my first job was. Oh, God, what was it? Was working, yeah, I, I worked there for a year, then I worked for another IT publication. 
Then they made me the, the, the website editor of a local paper in Brighton, uh, which is where I live, which is like 50 miles south of London by the sea. Lots of people come here to learn English. It's a good, it's a good city. It's good fun. Uh, so they made me website editor. Uh, you know, we spoke earlier about my lack of coding, uh, but I can do a bit of HTML. You know what I mean? Like, for, you know, just just just. just we to could argue it. because you know, uh, HTML is not really a programming language; it's a markup. I, I, I appreciate uh, that. So, I like <laughs> but I mean, there is like you know, there, we could now start a flame war on that topic, but let's not do that. Okay. Um, anyway, so I, <laughs> I did that as a job, and then I fell in love with someone. Uh, and realized that, you know, I probably need to know about the future because I wanted to have children. Um, so, so, so the need to learn about technology grew. I mean, I, I, I kind of, I, I, by that time, I kind of had left tech journalism, even though I was an editor of a, of a publishing site. Something else came along. Um, a local company had won the, the streaming rights uh, for the first series of Big Brother in the UK. Okay. So I went to work for them as a communications director uh, just when Big Brother began in the UK. I think that was 2000 or, or 99, no, 99 maybe. Um, and it was so exciting, you know what I mean? Like to be at the forefront of technology after wanting to be at the back of technology that, you know, when there was a guy that was kicked out of the Big Brother house, people were watching the internet for the first time. Yeah. Live. And you've been already there. Yeah, I was right in the middle of it. You know what I mean? Like, really right in the middle of it. When the guy was kicked off, he's quite famous in the UK. He's called Nasty Nick. I mean, he was basically a bit of a prick and an idiot. But they turned the cameras off in the house because they thought he was going to start a fight. Mm. So it didn't want live violence. So they kicked him out. And then I had all of the UK media offering me money, you know, because they knew that I was a communications director up to about 25,000 pounds. If you tell us where he is, you know, we'll give you 25K. Number one, um, I'm not sure if I would have accepted it, but 25K is 25K. Uh, and number two, I didn't know where he was. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's probably the major thing. <laughs> uh, that's the real reason. Well, I should have just taken the money and just said, oh, yeah. I don't know where he is. Um, but it was it was all great fun, um, and then from from that point, I went into the games industry. I was pretty early on with mobile games. You know what I mean? We, I did a deal with. Uh, I I heard that you actually lost a lot of money there. I mean, lost is maybe not the right word. It's um, you lost the chance to make a lot of money there. Oh. There, there was something with. with... Oh. Was it Angry Birds or was it? Uh, was it yeah, else? yeah, yeah. We, we, we. I worked for. I worked for mm. a, a, a games testing company called Player X in London, um, and we were very powerful at the time. We were between the developers um, and the publishers, which were basically the mobile operators. And at that time, developers were treated like scum. You know what I mean? They were at the bottom of the food chain. They had to come to. Uh, I love developers, by the way. They had to come to us with their games. Um, we would test their games, we would look for bugs, we would think about the idea, then we would take them to uh, the five mobile operators. Um, and it was an expensive process because it wasn't just about paying for the development costs. Um, you also had to pay for the uh, porting costs. In yeah. those days, to port from a Nokia to a, you know, whatever was out there, a WAP phone, you know. So we, we were... We were we were we missed it. Well, well, to be fair, I did miss the iPhone, but I think my CEO did, and I kept saying it's going to change everything. It's going to change everything. So um, we had a reputation of you know killing companies because we wouldn't take their games. But one of those companies was called Rovio Mobile. Um, okay. We made Forty-nine games for our processes, um, and we failed them all. Actually, I think fifty. And it was the 51st game, uh, and they had no money. They were running out of money. They called us the Rovio Killers. So they offered us Angry Birds um, for something like a 51% share for like $250,000 or something like that. And we said no. We turned down no. Angry Birds. Yeah. And I think then, you know, obviously everything changed. There was a launch of the iPhone. 
and then afterwards Android. Um, I, I don't know what I don't know if we'd have made it so successful uh, because you know the Rovio guys were a really smart team. You know we mm. were a little bit too early, I think. You know what I mean? We were having too much fun. Um, we were trying to do mobile video as well as everything else. Uh, so that is probably I'm probably the fifth Beatle. You know the guy that left uh, <laughs> John Lennon and Paul McCartney and said, "Nah, it's not enough." Well, the guy who left Apple, maybe. You know. Yeah, but you never know. You never know. Maybe it was good, so maybe yeah. it wouldn't have been a success. No, exactly. And I think the way we were behaving at the time, we were having a yeah. lot of partying, and I think if we, you know, received a billion dollars, I, I probably would not be here now. You know, yeah. save my life. <laughs> you see, so. It's a good thing. You should not regret it. I have no regrets, man. No regrets. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then, then, uh, yeah, you basically started contributing regularly to really big tech media, right? Well, no, not really. Um, it was uh, the time of the financial crisis. Mm. And uh, I, did, I said to my wife at the time, uh, let's take our five-year-old son to India. Let's go and live on the beach for a year. Because the financial crisis, I mean, it, it, you know, I'm going to lose my job because I was on big money in London. You know, we hadn't raised enough money. You know, we could easily rent out the house. We could live on the beach. I've been in London for three years, spent some time with our son. Um, so that's what we did. But what I used to do is I used to write a, a, a newsletter every Friday about the gaming industry, Monty's Gaming and Wireless Outlook, which was quite popular. You know, it was sponsored by Nokia and EA. Um, so I changed that to Monty's Indian newsletter, you know, about life in India, you know, mosquitoes, sugar, whatever. Uh, and then an English newspaper, The Telegraph, uh, got in touch with me and said, you know, how do you fancy writing, you know, writing for, for The Telegraph? It's like one of the major broadsheets. Uh, the Times and The Telegraph are the two biggest English uh, broadsheet intelligent publications. Um, but obviously, I was delighted. Do you know what I mean? So, so I got my kind of yeah. writing, writing back. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did a piece, a, a travel piece for the Financial Times about Sri Lanka, where I also went. Uh, wrote a piece for the Sunday Times about Kashmir, but that didn't make that didn't make it, unfortunately. Um, and so we spent two years in India. I bizarrely became a Bollywood film star. I was in two films as a villain, <laughs> uh, which is another story. Uh, and then okay. I came back. <laughs> yeah, weird. Uh, then I came back to the UK after two years in India. When our son was seven, it was time for him to get some stability. Uh, and then said to the Telegraph, how about I change my Indian stories into tech stories? Uh, and they agreed. I pitched the story. They said yes. And then from that, was probably about 10 years ago. And from that point, I just added more and more publications. You know what I mean? Like I, I was a false columnist for about three and a half years. Telegraph mm. for about the same amount of time. Uh, the big one was The Economist. I still write for The Economist. That's part of a family, which I'm absolutely honoured to be part of. BBC uh, Technology, Newsweek, MIT Tech Review, Wired, The Independent. I mean, just pretty much everyone, really. Yeah, that's, that's cool. But how do you keep yourself on track with uh, the news? Because well, what, I, what I learned is that, that you're kind of, you know, you can talk about all the tech topics and you're always at kind of the forefront. Um, we will talk a bit later about blockchain and NFTs and so on and about DeFi. But how, how do you keep yourself kind of updated? Well, you see, I mean, I would disagree with that. I mean, I don't think I am. I have ever been at the forefront. You know, I'm not an early adopter. I, I think I'm a lunchtime adopter. You know what I mean? Because... Yeah. It takes me. I'm not. I spent 20 years. I mean, I have to say it's now 3 p.m. set at yeah. uh, Central European time. It's 2 p.m. at 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 your place in in um, uh, in the UK. And you told yeah. me that you just had breakfast, right? So yeah. you are really the not the early adopter, but the lunch. Uh, lunch I will mean, maybe I'm a, a nightclub adopter. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the serious point is, I think that because I spent, you know. 15 years of my life about technology, there was a lot of holes in my knowledge, right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I could talk a good story, uh, and the internet changed my life. If it hadn't been for the internet, it would have been too late for me when I went into publishing at the end of the 90s. 
So I, I don't think I'm at the forefront of it, but but I can catch a wave. You know what I mean? I can smell mm. a fire. Yeah. yeah. I think I've been reasonably... Uh, it's getting earlier for me. You know what I mean? Late time, breakfast or lunchtime or, or whatever it is. I'm, I'm beginning to smell things a little bit earlier. Um, and But the, the thing about te tech journalists, and I don't consider myself a tech journalist anymore. I think, it, you know, I'm getting into, you know, uh, commercial life a little bit more is that journalists know they know a little bit about a lot of things you know yeah i know i know, I know about loads of things yeah um, it's not a bad thing i mean you cannot know a lot of things about a lot right. of things you know it's kind of uh, maybe but, Elon Musk. but whenever yeah but anyone yeah you know, i'm a generalist right but if anyone ever asks me if i'm a you know I'm a tech expert. I mean, it's it's laughable. I'm, I'm, I'm totally not a tech, tech tech expert. I just go along with what I think is coming next, you know, and, and it seems to be working. Yeah, that's that's good. And and um, I mean, when you when you have written for all these publications, um, have you have you then already started to to do you know speaking at events and emceeing or so, or is this some some yeah, different good. story? It's a good question. I think they, I think they go together. I think if they if they think that if they know that you're a Forbes columnist or a Telegraph columnist or an Economist writer, then that's when the invitations start to come in, right? Yeah. Because you seem to have you seem to have some type of reputation, uh, and then it's up to you. You know what I mean? I thought, well, why not? You know, why not become yeah. a list and a moderator? I mean, and that's probably the reason why we invited you three, four years ago to interview yeah. Steve Bosnick, because we saw you have a track record, right? So Yeah, but and um, the, track, the track record doesn't get any any less. You know what I mean? It's like I, I changed my LinkedIn profile recently to interview a, a very famous people. I mean, that's a bit... Yeah. <laughs> but cheap. it's to the point, actually. I mean, when it starts rolling, then it's rolling, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's not getting worse. Kim Kardashian, I mean, what? I mean, it's not. She yeah. was very, very charming, very nice. But if I'm going to be remembered for anything, it's been that you met Kim Kardashian, you failed Angry Birds, uh, and you had some Ethereum stolen in 2016. These are the th three things that I, I read remember. about that from your from your Gmail account or something. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at, the, at that time, it was about twenty-five thousand pounds. Now yeah. it's about six hundred thousand pounds. So, yeah, let's it wasn't. Not, my let's not talk about that. I think like everyone well, is see. having every stories week. like that. <laughs> every week, every week, I get about ten emails from people who say, "Oh, hi, Monty. I read your piece in the BBC about losing losing your Ethereum." Um, the same thing has happened to me. Now, help, yeah, me, help me get it back. I mean, sorry to swear, but fuck you. I never yeah. got it back. But so why would I help you <laughs> and put energy in <laughs> you to remind me all the time? Yeah, but maybe that's the point. Maybe there's just some <laughs> bad people out there who want to remind you. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean... I'm, I think we talked about the, the interviewing Kim Kardashian um, at our last World Congress this year, but um, you've also met uh, John McAfee, right? Yeah, no, uh, John and I are actually were, I mean, rest in peace, John, my friend. We became How was he as a person? Well, we, it was, I was invited, to, this is, I was invited to speak or to moderate John McAfee and this other guy. Uh, the two of them together uh, on stage. And, and I wasn't, I didn't really know who he was. You know, I don't do research, I just let it flow. So the, the audience again was crazy. The audience didn't really want to listen to this other guy called, he, he changed his name every year, he was called Synth, I think, that year. So um, in the middle of the conference, of the questions, I said, right, let's have enough of you, John, do you know what I mean, talking all the time, let's pass that over to Synth. Has anyone got any questions for Synth? No one had any questions. Oh. I said, come on, man, you must have one question. And in the end, the cameraman said, I've got a question for him. I said, well, thank you very much for saving my life, bro. Do you know what I mean? What's your question? Thank you very much. Um, it turned out that that guy was making a film about McAfee. It turned out that he'd never met McAfee. And it turned out that later I managed to get him into McAfee's room 
to complete his film. So it was a great story. So um, it, could, it went on and on and on. And at the end, my brain was thinking really quickly. And, and uh, I said, I said, you know, I've got an excellent chance here. Um, and then I said, right, has anyone got any questions for John? So everybody put their hands up, and I just stood up and I said, you had your chance earlier with Synth. You let, yeah. you let me go. You can fuck off. Do you know what I mean? And then we'll yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's come on. A, a few hours later, I get a Facebook message from the organiser of the conference, who I thought was my mate, but was someone else. And he said, um, we need to talk. I said, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Messed it up. Uh, so, so we spoke and he said, he said, Monty, I don't know you. You know, I've invited you to my conference. There's nearly 5,000 people here. We've given you the privilege of interviewing John McAfee. Uh, and you've basically told my audience to cough um, on stage. And I went, yeah. He goes, my wife and I just watched it on their laptop. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it ended up that I was on McAfee's <laughs> yacht that evening. Then two of his friends. He liked me, I think, because I didn't blow smoke up his backside. Um, we had a lot of conversations about drugs, drinking, and similar experiences. Uh, and you know, we'd spoke, we spoke. You know, we were good mates. Um, and he, he was a pirate, right? He was a chief pirate. I'm a I'm a junior pirate. Um, and he lived a life which is very difficult to live now. You know what I mean? It was very di it's very yeah. difficult to be like that now. Um, and, I, and I know his wife, Janet, she's an amazing woman. And I think it's very, very sad. I, th I think there was no way he was going to go back to the US. Um, there was no conspiracy. It's just like, you know what? A man runs out of steam. And when a man runs out of steam, do you really want to be in prison for the rest of your life? No. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a, absolutely. It's a absolutely. Um, let us come to... To the present a bit because you said uh, a couple of minutes ago that you you can smell when cool things come around the corner right I, I so, said I can you repeat it I said I thought I could I'm not I'm never I'm never a hundred percent sure yeah okay um, <laughs> good um, but actually I mean now you are chief evangelist at Siena Network Tell yeah. us a bit about it. What 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 is Siena and what are you doing there and how it comes and uh, yeah, just give us a short overview. Well, it, it came about at the end of last year. Um, an old contact of mine who I've got a great deal of respect for said, uh, "With you know, there's, we're set, there's setting up this uh, organisation where people can contribute with the community, uh, and we'd love you to be part of it." And it was like, well. I'd had all that Ethereum stolen before, you know. I wasn't really in, a, in a, I, I'd given up on blockchain and crypto. Yeah. The only blockchain work I was doing on stage was blockchain for good, you know, Africa, charities, uh, searching for real metals or, or for diamonds and making sure the blockchain could help in that respect. So it was, it was all about the kind of bigger picture. Yeah. Uh, and then, I, then people had knocked on my door, you know, and I looked at it and I just thought, yeah, I mean, wow, this is weird. Uh, so to give an example about why we need privacy, which is basically what, what, what CNN Network does, it preserves your pri pri privacy, but without making you anonymous. And I think this is a big problem for the crypto community, is that if you ever mention the word privacy, immediately they think about the dark web, they think about drug dealers, they think terrorists, they think about people to cheat in the tax man um, when well, this is the opposite of the case because privacy is a human right what you deserve and what I deserve and there are problems with the way that crypto is set up so if I owed you a thousand dollars you'd say to me here's my bank in Vienna this is the details I'd send you a thousand dollars you'd probably get charged a thousand and eighty dollars some ridiculous price uh, and it'd all be done you, you know, that's all it is. You just see that money, I'd see the money go, you'd see the money arrive. If I send you $1,000 by crypto, you can see every single transaction that I've ever made in crypto. Yeah. And I can see every single transaction that you've ever made in crypto. 
You know, people that, forget that. We, yes, and that's why you need privacy. You know, and it's not just me to you or you to me. It's also everybody else. Everybody else can see in the public blockchain what's going on. So there is this scourge called front running, where people can see what you're trading, bad actors, and then they can hijack your trade because they can see what you're trying to do just by paying a higher gas fee. So mm -hmm. it means a good guy with a computer power and more money to, to, to spend on gas fees or you know, a premium um, can basically take, take over from you. So privacy in that respect is really important. There is not any way that we're trying to make anything secret away from anything else, but the whole point is to give you privacy. You still go for a know your customer experience, you know, you still identify your privacy is, is, is basically defined by your identity, not that you're trying to disguise your identity. So we, we were, you know, it looks interesting. Uh, and we were trying to raise between 500 and 700 K to get this going in March. Uh, and by May, we had 11.2 million. Okay. You know, so it was this year, 2021? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, and we were, to be honest, we were surprised, you know, um, we were surprised. We'd obviously hit a, a sweet spot. I mean, you know, crypto was going up, right? So it's a crypto summer. So people wanted to diversify their assets. Yeah, and also I think agreed with us that you know you need to have privacy when, when you're when you're when you're doing crypto transactions. That we have competitors, of course. You know we believe that we're the best ones, obviously. Um, but this is a, this is a problem. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And at what stage are you currently? So what's what's on the map right now? What uh, at what stage are you currently? So what's, what's yeah? So the... so so, the, the, so if you can imagine a Dex decentralized exchange. Such as Pancake Swap or Sushi Swap, we now have Sienna Swap. So we're creating liquidity. You know, we're bringing in people, giving them great interest rates, APYs on their on their proof of stake, not proof of work. We're we're yeah. very you know, pro pro uh, pro ecology. We don't want to waste the world's energy resources. So it's proof of stake. What people stake into their pools, which adds to their to their to their earnings. Um, and shortly, you know, we'll be launching Sienna Lend, which means, you know, obviously you can borrow and you can lend money, you know, which, which, I, which I think we think is a bit of a game changer for the future. But there are other things happening beneath it, you know, in the, in the, in the area itself. Sienna's protocol is built on the secret network protocol, which is okay. built on Cosmos. And if you can think of public well, all types of blockchains being islands in an archipelago, but there are no bridges that connect them. That's what Cosmos is trying to do. So, you know, we're in it for the long term. There's no, we think this is going to change things. I mean, we can talk about decentralization, if you like, as a, as a concept, uh, but maybe that's kind of, you know, done, done that a bit too often. But the mm -hmm. idea is to give people privacy and to help with Web3, and the next stage of this, you know, because the, 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 the amount of crypto news every week just increases and increases and increases. It's yeah, it's enormous. The it's really enormous. It's amazing. Um, Monty, when you heard for the first time the term blockchain or generally about blockchain and cryptocurrencies, bitcoins, do you remember what you what you were thinking back then, like about all of this? Well, it was funny. I was working. I still had friendships with the games company where I used to work, and they used to do this weird thing called mining. You know what I mean for Bitcoin, and it was like, oh god, it's just gamers being geeks. Yeah. I suppose that was the first ever time. Um, mm. And and again, I wasn't early to it. It was only about five five years ago. Uh, and then it was just a couple of people I respected said a couple of things. Uh, Blockchain, what's, what's, I mean, it took me ages to get my head around it. You know what I mean? Because it was so ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. The chain of blocks. Okay, Satoshi. Oh, that sounds, who's he? Is he real? Is he not? Is he a coder? I, I, you know, it, it just, it took me a long time to get the epiphany. And it wasn't, aha. It was more like, well, why don't I get paid? You know, you, you hear about the mayor of New York, or the mayor of Miami announcing last week that they want to be paid in Bitcoin. 
following basketball stars and all that stuff. I wanted to be paid in Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum about four years ago. So I was early in that respect. Do you know what I mean? That I got paid yeah. because I presume they were going to go up and they did, obviously. Um, but I didn't have a I didn't have a light bulb moment. I kind of had a, a, a dimmer moment. Do you know what I mean? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously the lights came on. And what what was that moment? I just think it was just I think I think it was a basically more of a political belief about decentralization. And yeah. the amount, lack of lack of financial education that I had and the amount of times I've been ripped off by sending you a thousand dollars and getting charged at eighty dollars or getting charged four dollars to use you know a, a ATM in, in Vienna or in Slovenia or whatever. The amount of times that I've been ripped off. And, and I'll give you one example about how useless traditional banks are. I wrote a piece uh, for the BBC about meet the banks of the future. You might mm -hmm. even like them, you know what I mean? And then I mentioned this story in the piece and it was, you know, I, I, I'm nothing against Lloyds Bank, they're fine. Um, but I forgot to take a hundred pounds out of the ATM. I forgot, it was my mistake, you know, someone stole it, you know, uh, apparently. So, so I said, I rang them up and I said, you know, I've done this. Now, bearing in mind I've been a customer for 25 years, bearing in mind that I've been overcharged for just about everything. Any normal neobank or new fintech would just say, don't worry about it. You know, we'll, we'll reimburse you the 100 pounds. You're a great customer. Mm -hmm. But the bank said, oh, we're going to investigate it. And it took six weeks for them to look at camera footage to look at all of these things, to, to find out what time it was. And then they said, uh, no, it's been stolen. We can't give you your money back. I mean, it must yeah, have cost... There is no customer service anymore. You know what I no, mean? No, it must have cost thousands. Of course, of it's money and it's banking and it's finance. But at the end, I mean, it's about people, right? And um, no matter what's the pro product, if you're in a restaurant or eating a pizza, or if you say, okay, it's maybe not the best one or there's something mistaken, then uh, you kind of get a compensation or they kind of try to be nice to you. It doesn't matter. And even yeah. with, with software as a service products, if you are not satisfied, you kind of you know always get a way around to, to speak with people. I think the finance industry is a bit of, um, how do you say, how would I say, uh, um, they are still trying to get into the new century. Well, they are, but they've got really, really rubbish coding infrastructure. Mm. You know what I mean? It's, there's, crypto is the same as fintech. The old banks either want to work with the new guys or the mm. old guys or old women, you know, or whatever, want to just destroy them, you know, mm. and, and, and it's just so stupid. But, but, but in answer to your question is that why I got really interested in it was literally that, the decentralization of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I want to spend you a thousand dollars. If I give you a thousand dollars in Vienna or you come to Brighton, you just hand it to me. There isn't a guy that stands there or a woman that stands there and says, hey, I want eighty dollars. We're perfectly cool together. We don't need the middle man. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And that's pretty much what I believe in. I, I think that when it comes to governments or or anything, banking, or anything, we've never worked out how to centralize stuff, right? Mm -hmm. We're perfectly happy in our own communities with our own tribe, with our own people. We don't need anyone, anyone else to, to help us do what we do. So it's it's pretty much as, as macro as that for me, you know what I mean? It's decentralization, I believe in it. Okay, we are, we are seeing kind of evolution revolution in the financial industry with um, all the fintechs out there and decentralizing uh, financial services and so on um, as someone who is basically as you said like uh, involved in, in many things and um, as someone who thinks to to smell things coming um, do you think what what is the next what is the next big thing or what what comes after that especially in the financial industry well, I think what's going on at the moment, and which is the big fire that everyone is smelling, is NFTs, right? Yeah. Non, non fungible tokens. I, I don't think that many people knew what fungible meant 12 months ago. Yeah, I mean, let's explain it first because there is so many people, even developers, um, struggling with uh, 
I mean, not only the term NFT, but let's let's say like, what's the purpose of it? Like, what what why is it there? And 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 is it a hype or is it something that really is there to 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 stay or or what do you think? I think everything's a hype, right? At the beginning, everything's mm -hmm. a hype. You know, you 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 see this guy sell his what artwork for seventy million dollars. So and so, so and so, so and so does this, does that. You know, it's but, but, but most things that are hypes generally become mainstream. So you can't ignore what's going on. I think it's over hypes at the moment, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it's it's coming. The, well, I mean, I said to my friend yesterday, if someone says the word metaverse to, again to me. They're either going to buy me a drink or end up in the ditch. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? But the, the way that I think about it, as someone that was against technology for 15 years, uh, I'm, I, I might be against this because I don't want to live. I, I want to talk to you, man, face to face. You know, I don't want to be doing this interview on Zoom where yeah. I put my hat on in Brighton and we're looking at, you know, lags and times. You know, I just want to be in the same room as you having a chat, you know. Tapping you on the Absolutely. arm, smelling you. I'm just saying that it's all yeah. we're, we're, we're doing something with sight and sound. Two senses out of five. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And and I like being human. I like screwing up. I like But then what's the purpose of, 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 of NFTs? Well it's because people that there are other people who are younger than me uh, really enjoy the, their online lives. You yeah. know what I mean? I think everyone will be sucked into the computer at the end. You know what I mean? The more powerful the computer, yeah, absolutely. you'll probably be able to you'll probably be able to find some two new new technical technology that can create life. You know what I mean? You yeah. have these Googles and Googles and Google bits or whatever, and it'll be like if you play this game, you can create life. You know, mm. I think maybe that's where we would begin. I mean, we will be in this metaverse, right? Yeah, they call like they, they don't say really metaverse. Is. Don't say metaverse. Matrix. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I mean, we will pay with those... some cryptocurrencies and we will own NFTs and basically that's, yeah. that will be life. But it's not just about that, Siad, right? It's about status. Mm. You know what I mean? The reason yeah. it's, it's, that's it's still the point, a, yes. Yeah, $200 million in a, in a Picasso, yeah. it's not even to show it, it's to have it mm. and to know people that you have it. And there are all things that can happen with NFTs, you know, That person may spend fifty million dollars on on a piece of artwork, NFT. May offer share a pixel for one dollar with people so you can own it. He may, she may open access to the have, pixel. Have you created your own NFT? I wrote my son a poem uh, on yeah. his 18th birthday about him taking my crown, and I'm in the process of creating that poem as an NFT. We might also create an NFT of the first uh, questionnaire that I sent to Sienna about what we were trying to do uh, and how much that's changed <laughs> over the last 10 months. I mean, I think it's a piece of art anyway. So, so, so uh, to, to me, an NFT is, is, is a form of status. You know, it's new things. There are very beneficial things about it. I think the Kings of Leon uh, produced mm. an NFT of their music. I remember this shit from the from the late 70s when you could buy a Sex Pistols record of a, a picture sleeve or yellow vinyl. I mean, dude, like that was an NFT, right? In its own way. Yeah. I, I'm was... just thinking about, you know, like like uh, children or also I, I was collecting these cards of, of soccer players, football yeah. players, you know, like and if you think about it like from 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 the perspective of our let's say parents or grandparents or whatever. I mean, they must have also thought about why does he collect these things? Yeah, yeah. It's not the real person. It's just like a sticker. But it's not. But you see, I think what people get. And then you can exchange it with friends and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah, dude. Panini World Cup, absolutely. You know, but that was when we were. That's when that was the first time that we were made to be addicted to subscription models, right? I hate mm. subscription models, but we had to finish the album. Right, we had to get a picture of you know some Austrian player or some you know Argentinian player. It was a subscription model. We had to keep buying the cards, keep buying the cards. Album was free. Keep buying the cards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean. It was a, it was a form of subscription, a, a collectible, 
which is what it what, what it was. NFTs are not just digital collect collectibles for consumers, right? That's not just what they are. If you think that the Kings of Leon could uh, do an NFT and make two or three million dollars uh, in the middle of a pandemic, and then that NFT is sent to space with either Bezos or, or, or Branson, I, I can't remember which one it was, you know what I mean? There are huge, huge benefits here for artists that have been ripped off by record companies in music in the past and have been ripped off by Spotify and streaming yeah, companies. I hate Spotify. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I hate it because I used to like going to the record shop to buy my records, you know what I mean? So, so for artists, you know, it's another form of merchandise, isn't it? You know, NFT mm -hmm. merch. You know, that's great for artists that have to tour all the time because they can't make any money out of selling music because of the, the, the streaming giants such as Spotify. You know, yeah. I think it goes for artists. The same thing for people that created content years ago, you know, and weren't paid enough for them. You know, if, if, you, if you've got an old Pink Floyd lyrics, you know, that you've, you know, you can, you can sell that for fortunes, you, you, you know. So, so, so while I'm not the one who wants to be sucked into the machine and have status, you know, inside the machine, I'd rather be out here useless and f flesh and blood. And I know there are a lot of developers out there that think that we are just flesh and blood and we should all be in the machine. I appreciate that. Um, but I think it's, in answer to your question, yes, it is overhyped, but yes, it will be a thing. Uh, and yes, it will take some time to find out exactly what that is. But, I mean, Disney came in today, I think. You know what I mean? There are multiple ways to make money out of this. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So it will still just need a bit of time. Agreed. That's what you're saying. Yep. Okay. Monty, um, coming slowly to an end, what does the future bring for you? What are you on? So you are now full-time at Siena, right? Uh, well... <laughs> Not full time. I mean, I, I do other things. Well, let's say fully committed. Fully committed, one hundred percent. Yeah, fully committed. Fully committed. Perfect. The team. Uh, what yeah. are your What are your plans afterwards? You still well, a young I, guy. Well, I, I've just got divorced. You know, my son is about to go to university. Um, they have this ridiculous system of of buying a house in this country. So I sold. We sold the family house in July. Uh, and we was completing on the house in December on December the eighth, but the buyer pulled out last week after oh. five months of rubbish. So on a personal level, I live in a really nice flat in Brighton, but it's not a home for my son. So I need to buy a house, you know, as soon as possible. So that's on a, on a personal level. Uh, the plan was to take January off uh, and go to some places that I've always wanted to see and have a bit of danger. I want to go to Algiers in Algeria. Uh, Ethiopia is my one of my favorite countries on the world. You know, there's a big conflict going on there. I wouldn't mind going there, maybe do some writing. Um, I wouldn't mind going to the Sinai Desert in Egypt, which is where I first went in 83 when it was empty. Okay. Uh, Do you speak I, Arabic, actually? I, I'm not sure if I've read something. Yeah, I speak Arabic badly, but it's enough. Yeah, I, and, and that would be another thing. I would really, really, really like to learn Arabic properly. You yeah. know, I can write a little bit. I mean, I can write Saeed, you know, just. Um, but I would really like to study it. I would love to do it. But I just need, I just need a bit of time. I've been working pretty hard, you know, for, for 15 years. And I would like a month off, you know, go on a train somewhere or some shit, do some writing. I'm writing a book at the moment as well about... Okay, about? Well, I, I just... I, I wrote a book in 94, and then I, I've got a great friend of mine in uh, Canada. We were, we had a, you know, anyway. Uh, and, and we have really good... We, we write each other letters, you know what I mean? You know, like, I don't answer for two weeks and all that stuff. So then I thought, the, the, the quality of the writing that I'm sending her, why don't I change it as if I'm writing to my best friend who died four or five years ago. Mm. We spread his ashes on the Ganges at Varanasi, me and, my, me and his sister. And I just thought, why don't I write to him so I don't have to worry about 
you know, editors or publishers, you know, I'm writing to my best friend, you can fuck off if you don't like it. Oh, so okay. it's like letters to a friend, in a, a, a letters to a departed friend in a time of plague. And it also mixes up with the, the, the many, many times that we went to India together and how okay. India was changed. So are uh, you finishing it soon or? I reckon I'm a third of the way through. I think the title was a little bit long-winded. I need to call it something else. But it's, I, 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 it, I've been waiting all my life to write a, a really good book. Mm. Uh, and this might be my opportunity. You know, so I'll still, I mean, I'll still be, it's not like I'm retiring from tech, you know, there's loads of things going on, but I just would like to dedicate a bit more time to traveling, uh, seeing the world again. I, I miss the world uh, yeah. and read loads of books and, you know, become good at Arabic and play the guitar. I'm a fucking hippie, dude. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I mean, you can combine, hopefully, soon. Some traveling with some conference speaking again, maybe. Yeah, I mean, but I, I, I mean, I was working from home or well, working from India in 2008. So I'm yeah. slightly annoyed that everybody's working from home now. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was, it, was, it was my world. Now it's everybody else's world. But yeah, I mean, but that portfolio career of having consultancy roles and non exec roles and, you know, consultancy gigs and speaking at conferences and writing. Yeah, you know, that's not going to stop for me.